All right, here we go. I'm writing the numbers down. Randomly picking who's going first. Team five. Team, team five? five. Somebody raise their hand for team five. Come off mute and say, I want co host. Hey, yes, one. we're here. Right. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Christina. I'm going to make you co host. Right. Is that correct? Or? Yes, sounds good. All right. So for you, we're going to just do a little bit of experiment. What I want you to do is pull up your slides and get ready to start. And then I'm going to start the timer just to show you where it is to make sure you can see it. Uh, this is the first time we've tested out this okay. timer. So tonight we want to get through the kinks to make sure it's going to work next week. So go ahead and start sharing your screen and uh, we'll get into that mode and then I'll start the timer just as a test. All right, and can someone let me know if they can see it? Because I know I was struggling with that. GM, GBM NeoBio. Yes. We can see it. Okay, so I'm just going to start the timer. This is not your timer. Uh, just to make sure, let's see if I can, I don't want to pin this. Yeah, and I can see it on my screen too. You can see the timer? Yes. Great, okay, well, I'm going to reset it then. Okay, if you're ready, just give me the thumbs up and I'll start the clock when you're ready. Okay, I just want to give a forewarning. We're still working on some slides, so, but I'll just go through what we've got. Yeah, everybody's going to be in the All same right. boat in that regard, Christina. Don't worry about that. Give it your best. Okay. All right. Ready. All right, so um, I would like to introduce y'all to GBM NeoBio. Glioblastoma is one of the most invasive brain tumors, accounting for about 52% of primary brain tumors. Um, it is highly lethal with an average patient lifespan of 12 to 15 months upon diagnosis. And we can all recognize somebody who has passed away from glioblastoma, including uh, John McCain, Ted K Bo Biden, and Ted Kennedy. Currently, uh, the current standard of treatment for glioblastoma includes surgery, radiation, uh, followed by chemotherapy, but oftentimes this current treatment is toxic and low, uh, has low efficacy, which leads to, um, which leaves patients helpless. And uh, the cells will oftentimes also develop resistance to chemotherapy, resulting in recurrent recurrence occurring in about 80% of the patients and the cycle um, repeats itself. And over the past three decades, um, newly introduced GBM therapies have only been able to improve the medium survival of patients by an average of only three months. So GBM has a global impact and it impacts three, there's three new cases per 100,000 uh, in individuals. And the impact ranges from um, the United States to Europe to all the way uh, over to Asia. Uh, our prime customer uh, targets are individuals who have been exposed to the certain risk factors, including radiation exposure. They have a family history of GBM, uh, some epigenetic modifications. They're of the male gender and they're between the ages of 45 to 70. Uh, the median age of diagnosis of GBM is about 58 years old and death occurs within less than 10 years of that at 65 on average. And the relative survival rates are 35% one year beyond diagnosis and treatment. And uh, this decreases down to only 4.7% if you try to live to, uh, to up to five years. So currently with conventional chemotherapy or radiotherapy, we're able to target the GBM cancer cells. However, we still get these tumor initiating cells that persist. Therefore, the tumor develops and the patient relapses. With our solution, um, we're introducing novel bromodomain inhibitors that are targeting these tumor initiating cells and thus have been shown to improve current treatments. Our unique value propositions is that currently patients undergo high dose of chemotherapy and this results in um, highly toxic treatment. 
our solution will allot for a lower dose of chemotherapy, which will potentially reduce the overall toxicity of treatment. Further, the survival rate, as I previously mentioned, is less than 5% going into five years. Our solution will hopefully prolong patient survival. In addition, recurrence occurs in about 80% of patients. But since our solution is specifically targeting a specific subset of cells, um, we're hopefully able to minimize this recurrence. And we're still editing the slide, but um, in our competitive analysis, we're um, comparing how our solution compares in toxicity, uh, targeting cancer initiating cells, increasing the overall survival, um, whether it's effective and current and recurrent GBM, how easy it is to manufacture and whether it require, requires daily application. And once I finish filling this out, you'll find that our solution um, competes fairly well against our competitors. Uh, progress made thus far is that we've been able to identify the candidate drugs. We've got the proof of concept experiments completed and shown um, reduced tumor cell proliferation and enhanced animal survival in mice and even decreased brain tumor volume. Um, thus far, Dr. Pepper has been awarded in $80,000 of institutional grants and um, has filed the US and international patents. And then our milestones, including participation in uh, this competition. In June, we will be um, applying for an NIH grant and moving forward in the coming years, we will be completing preclinical studies and completing IND filing. And then we're still working on our business model, revenue model, and the final big ask. And this is our team, Dr. Pepper, Fatima, and me. And yeah, that's it. All right, thanks for the pitch. I'll jump in here. Uh, I think I'm gonna, I'll be giving feedback for the first and then I think the rest of the team will jump in. But uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here and, and for providing some feedback on your pitches. I know from firsthand that you all have put a lot of work into this point and that there's still a week left so that you can continue to fine tune this um, for, for the final pitch. So. I'll go through some notes uh, that I took here and actually quickly, could you, do you know your business model, even though it's not on the slide, could you talk through it in maybe, you know, 30 seconds or so, or are you still no, working Fatima. through the, the, we're still working incident? through it. Okay. But Fatima, uh, you want to in and say anything? Not really, because it's, uh, it's really difficult for treatments and it's like, it's a very, long uh, process like drug development is about 10 years and uh, so we are still working on it to see which companies which pharma companies are uh, working more on glioblastoma and but uh, so far we don't have anything solid okay yeah as you're looking through the business model also consider reimbursement uh, that's for all the medical device and and drug companies out there and, just, and putting that in the slide as well too just that you understand that is this reimbursable, is this patient pay, you know, how are you gonna get uh, paid for it? It may be that a doctor is, or a hospital is buying it, but then they would potentially write it off and the insurance would pay for it. So just understanding with the reimbursement at the end, including that in your business model will be, a, it may be a question that the judges ask uh, on the final day. So let's see, um, I'm very guilty of this and this is um, something that I'm trying to get better at too, but try not to say phrases that as everyone knows or we all can recognize because not everyone in the room may not know. So that was specifically in the slide with the three people that had passed away mm -hmm. that like I, I, I may not know one or two or, or any of them if I'm just moved to this country, for, for example. So mm -hmm. maybe, and this is a chance to make it personal too. You know, you, 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 some of you may have even lost loved ones. You know, here's here's uh, three you know, well-known people that, that unfortunately have passed. So you can kind of make that little connection to where it's personal, but also not saying like, we can all recognize it because maybe not everyone can. And, and we do that all the time. It's like, you know, as we all know, this, this, this. It's like, well, I didn't know that. So now I feel like I should have known that. 
Uh, but that's just something that I, I still, again, six years after <laughs> pitching for six years is still something that I'm, that I'm working on. Um, let's see, the customer slide, I think that's what it was, the one with the statistics uh, on it, that had a lot of statistics and numbers. So it's hard for, for the audience to pick like what's the most important. So I was, I was looking at what I was trying to think was important and I was listening to you and there's just lots of numbers floating around. So I lost track of what was the home run, but what stood out to me was that if you're diagnosed at 58 and the average age of death is 65, that's seven years. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is scary and unacceptable. And that is why you are in business. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge, I mean, I was just, you, you, you can, you can have the other stats up there and people can see them. And I appreciate that you went back and you, those relatives to elaborate to you, you went back and you showed, this is how we can you know, improve that. So that tied the knot uh, or that, that, that tied the story together pretty well. Uh, but it just, when you were going through it, it was a lot of numbers to keep up with in a short period of time. So I would consider either focusing on one and letting, like I came to the conclusion 58 and 65, that's seven years. So maybe you can just say, you could say that's seven years from diagnosis to death and you don't have to say average age is 50, 58 and then so you can kind of jump to a conclusion and give them the punchline without reading the data on there. Um, if that makes sense on, on this slide. It's not like a lot of numbers, which is great, but it was a lot when you were reading it off and I was trying to look at it uh, all at the same time. Let's see, just so I like to keep track of timing too on, on where you are. So about halfway through the presentation, you were on your value proposition slide. So I know you still had time left over and you still had to go through your, your, business, um, your, your business model slide and your revenue model slide. But just so you know where you were at each slide, about halfway through three and a half minutes, you were at the value proposition slide. So if that feels comfortable for you where you want to be, then you're on pace. If it's too far down, then you may need to like speed it up a little bit, but that's just a uh, just some quick insights there. Um, I think on the progress slide, you said the professor was awarded 80,000, but the slide said 50,000. I don't know if that was a typo there or. Oh, yeah, there was, um, so he, it was, it was on the same date he received. Um, oh, got it, those combined, okay. So I just combined them for, um, just for like timing purposes. Or I could okay. say them separately too, but it just, I didn't know how to um, tell, talk about that because it was on the same day. Yeah, I think you can just combine them, even though they're two separate grants, you can just have that as one. And this may be an opportunity to have less text on the slide, because if you're going to say 80, then it makes sense to say awarded 80,000 grant, uh, collaborative grants from UTHC for two years. And, and that, that's fine. It's $8,000 worth of grants for two years of work. Uh, I think that'll be okay. So you could remove potentially the bottom or the top one if you wanted or replace it with something else um, that, and I, maybe you can even put the starting of this company, you know, in March of 2021, you can remove one of these, switch it over and say, March, 2021, we, we founded GBM uh, NeoBio. And that's, that's a, a pretty cool kind of end to the progress today. Cause I think that is, that is important. Uh, those are my comments that I had, but overall, great job, you know, getting through it and then looking forward to seeing the, the final the final pitch. Thank you. I think, yeah, I thought, you know, we saw some good progress from when we reviewed it yesterday. Um, the one thing that I'm going to go back to what Isaac said on the customer side. Um, mm -hmm. Remember, we said you could you could move those into two or three different slides, right? I mean, I think what one thing that Isaac's saying that I keyed off on was there was a lot of stuff there on that same page, right? But each one of those components, especially the top right-hand corner where it's showing the ages and everything else, um, that's, that's very compelling, right? So instead of throwing it all in this one slide, even though you did make some great changes, you, you know, Isaac, for your edification, we had five years, four years, three years, two years, one year, and here as well, we took out three, you know, two, three, and four, just to do one and five. That cleaned it up a little bit. But I do think, you know, maybe spending, maybe putting one of these statistics very large on the screen, rolling through them, uh, would be cause less confusion, especially that median age one, which Isaac, I, we all agree, that's a scary one. So, 
Um, and general, my feedback is, is related to that. Uh, but otherwise, I, I've seen some good progress when we reviewed it the other day. So I appreciate it. Anybody else? On this slide, on this slide, remember we talked about maybe not even having that shown until after you discuss your risk factors. Like it can be on the same slide, but mm -hmm. like maybe not let it pop out until you actually reach the point where you're at, where you're discussing it. Because we're, again, we're looking at this whole slide and there's a lot of things and you're starting over here, but we're looking over here because we see numbers and we wanna make sure that we process and understand the numbers. So um, maybe focus there, bring that in with the survival rates, you know, as you're discussing them. And um, I think we talked the same thing. We talked about using one of the ages. I don't think it's necessary to use both. I tend to favor death, but maybe just say medium age of diagnosis is at 58 with a, a mean survival of seven years with five years being less than 5%. Um, that's all I have for that one. Okay. Yeah, and I just have a real general comment. Um, unless I'm remembering it wrong, I remember there was a lot more text in your first presentation. So I think you did a really nice job cleaning that up. And especially with that graphic, go back to the world map, especially with that one. I mean, I, I think you did a great job. It looks a lot better. So um, good job on that aspect. Yeah. Thank you. Go to the next slide after the customer slide. Uh, that one's, I, I like exactly what you said. We talked about that. You did that perfectly. The next one. So the unique value proposition, I still don't, I'm, I'm not sure if you're emphasizing the importance of the survival that you saw in the animals. Because what I heard was like, well, hopefully we'll be able to see that there is a survival and hopefully, like use that word, hopefully. I, I probably wouldn't use that word myself um, because what you've already done in your proof of concept is show that animals will have a prolonged survival. So I, I would actually concentrate on what you know, which is we, we see prolonged survival, which should translate into humans. We don't know that yet, obviously. I, wouldn't, I would just say that this is what it is in animals, which corresponds to whatever months or time in humans. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty, you know, expected. Like, you know, whenever we see an animal experiment, you know, a lot of times we'll calculate that into human years. So, and the other thing too, is that hopefully you said the same thing with the recurrence, the 80% for 80 I just wouldn't like be a little bit more strong, you know, stronger about your assertion. Um, Cause these are, these are really important unique value propositions that you've already proven in your animal model. Mm hmm for sure. Anybody else? What's the time, Brian? Yeah, um, and we have time for one more comment if we need to, but if everybody's gone, it'd be great to move on. Well, great job in incorporating this, you know, all that stuff, that was really good. Right now, y'all are at six minutes and 31 seconds. So y'all actually have some time too, so. You wanna go to the next slide then? Let's just look through it. Uh, I can't remember if there was anything. I Let's go, go to the next one. You're gonna work on that, we already said. Uh, yeah, agree with what, um, what Isaac said about just combining those. And then this, I'm still, I'm gonna edit it. Okay. We added, we decided to add like a milestone slide and then we're still working on our business and revenue and ask. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Great. Okay, team. You know, we're going to schedule another time for a one-on-one -on -one, um, between the now and next Thursday, beginning of the day. Um, and we'll uh, cover some ground there. We, we definitely want to give you a, a few days to, to catch up, but we'll, we'll square some time away for you all for another one-on-one. -on -one. Good job, great progress, and let's move on to the next team. So the next team is team number two. You may come off mute, off video. Hey, off all. Video. I hope you guys can hear me. Yes. Oh. Rohan, you're going to be presenting? No. 
Uh, no, you were saying, I, sorry, Ron, Ron, you were doing your job of saying, yes, we hear you. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I'm making you co-host. Hang on. Thank you, Rohan, for all the times. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you should be co-host now. Um, sorry, it's not showing the program as such in the share window. Yep, there you go. Got it. Yep, it's coming up now. Okay. Hold on. Uh, let me figure out this uh, timer thing. I can't see the timer right now. Sorry, Ryan, um, have you, have we started the timer? No, 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 I, I'm sorry. I thought you were doing a few more things and you were going to give me the high. No, I, I was just that. waiting because I can't see the timer in yeah. the window. I'm going to start it right now. And when I do, you can get started. Ready? Yep. You see the clock starting? I can't see the clock on the window. I mean, anywhere. Okay. You don't worry about the clock. I'm going to figure this out like we're doing testing. I'm going to tell you to go and I'm going to give you yeah. signs. Then say verbally go. Okay. Yeah. That would yeah. be great. So um, just start when you're ready. All right. So I'm starting now. Good evening, all. Um, I'm excited to uh, share our discovery tonight with you guys regarding the precision therapy of leukemia. So as, as we know that leukemia is one of the major type of cancer and almost 60,000 uh, new patients get diagnosed. And for 2021, it's been estimated that almost 23,000 people are gonna die because of the leukemia. If you see the distribution of the leukemia deaths in United States, you can see that it's pretty much um, located in the central region of the United States where we are located. And unfortunately, the age group which is highly affected by leukemia is children between age of zero to 14 and 15 to 19. It literally broke my heart for the first time when I joined St. Jude and I went into the cake cafe for having my lunch. And I saw a kid just like this one, walking with an IV drip going on continuously in her veins and she was coming down walking with that drip for her lunch. So this is the condition of the kids right now who are battling with leukemia, who have to come to the hospital for taking the IV drip for the chemotherapy. Now, what exactly happens in this particular type of leukemia? In the leukemia, leukemic cells, there are multiple cellular pathways, one of which is very important, which is controlled by a protein called as JAK2 protein. Now this JAK2 protein, if it gets mutated or it is more produced, it basically activates a cancer pathway as such, which leads to the more division of the cells and eventually leading to, to the metastasis. Now, once this particular thing happens, whatever drugs which has been currently available to block these two types of JAK2, these drugs are not specific and precise. And since they are not specific and precise, you need to inject more of these drugs. And since you are including more amount of drug, it is leading to the more side effects. Now, since these drugs are need to be put in with IV, uh, because no orally bioavailable bio drug is present. So you have to have the hospital visits and that's why the total outcome of leukemia is very poor. So, to circumvent this particular problem, 
the first we need to understand how the conventional drugs actually work. So this is the current drug. This is the Jack2 protein. And the drug is going to bind with the Jack2 protein and it's going to block it. That's it. So one particular molecule of drug is going to block only one molecule of Jack2. And that's it. It is only blocking it. It is not degrading at all. At the same time, in cell inside the cell, there is another process which works fantastically to degrade the natural proteins. But however, this particular degrader does not know that it has to degrade Jack2. So that's where our invention comes into picture. So we invented something called as Protec, and that's why our company's name is Protecure, because Protec is actually proteolytic targeting chimera. What does this small molecule does is it brings this degrader to the Jack2 and thus eventually leads to the degradation of this particular Jack2. Now, not only this, it also stays there inside the cell and it gets recycled. Since it's getting recycled, all the time it's present inside the cell, it keeps on degrading Jack2 and thus leading to the decreased levels of Jack2 and eventually leading to the cancer cell death. So why protect? Because first of all, it is degrading the Jack2 protein specifically uh, and not only blocking it. It is very specific and precise for Jack2. It has 100,000 times more higher efficiency uh, than the current drugs, which means that you have to give very low amount of dose. Most importantly, these products, they are recycled. So since they are present in the cells, they are going to keep on degrading the Jack2 protein. And the most important uh, property of these product is you can actually formulate them to have a tablet. So you don't have to go to the hospital every time for the IV drip. So we have done the competitive analysis with respect to our drug, uh, which we want to develop along with the other competitors. As you can see that our drug is uh, outperforms with many different uh, things like intracellular target, systemic de delivery, bioavailability, catalytic mode of action and very low amount required for its action. So how we are going to get this drug and develop into our company or the strategy? So first we are going to start with the phase one where we will be establishing our company at the center of United States where it's a more amount of leukemic cases have been um, discovered. So in here, first we'll be obtaining the exclusive IP rights from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in a way, we'll be paying royalties for this exclusive IP license. And after that, we will be establishing the preclinical studies for our Protax. Uh, and after the uh, preclinical studies are going on, we'll be spreading the word about our Protax uh, product through different conferences, American uh, Cancer Society and Leukemia, as well as Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Once our phase one is going on, in the phase two, we will be uh, giving the non-exclusive IP rights to major pharma companies like Pfizer, Johnson Johnson, Novartis, and others, who uh, in turn will be paying royalties to us. Once these uh, non-exclusive rights are shared, uh, this will lead to the GMP manufacturing of our drug and the clinical trial of it. Once the clinical trial is ongoing, we'll get the clinical trial data from all the companies, so which we will use for our next phase, which is our R&D phase or the expansion phase. We'll be enrolling several hospitals for this clinical trial. And uh, in whatever data we have got from the clinical trial, we'll be using for uh, aiming our research towards the new target. Because as you know, there are multiple uh, disorders which occurs just like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and different oncoproteins, which is actually due to the proteins which gets accumulated inside the cells. And finally, we'll be collaborating globally to uh, spread this product more in the more niche market markets. So progress so far, uh, we have done the research from 2018 to 2019 and we have discovered this Jack2 Protac. Uh, this is the very simple diagram showing that the top two panels is basically the mice which is having the leukemia. That's why it shows the color green and the mice which were treated with our compound, it shows no color, which means that they're free of tumor cells. Now, in the second part of uh, the 2020, we have presented this data in Cold Spring Harbor, as well as the Transcription Therapy Symposium. Uh, we have filed this patent. This is a patent number for us. And uh, we communicated this paper in the later half of 2020. 
And I'm very happy to uh, share this news with you guys that this paper has been accepted in one of the reputed journal called as Blood uh, just two days back. Uh, we have also initiated uh, the talks with um, IP department of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Our team is formed, our business plan uh, is formed, and we have also pitched this idea at MSC 2021. Uh, so for this particular phase one, we will be asking total of three, uh, $390,000, which of which 90,000 will be going towards obtaining the IP uh, license from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and the preclinical studies will require $300,000. So this is our team, uh, Dr. Jakey, who has mainly involved in the research part of it along with uh, my group. And Caitlin is uh, currently a student occupational therapy at uh, University of Tennessee Healthcare Center. And that would be all from my side. Uh, thank you. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, I think this, this flowed very nicely. I was able to, to follow along very well. Um, just on the last team, the GBM Neobio, I forgot, but there, I didn't hear an ask in that slide. And when you, when you ask on, on this one, I was like, okay, there's an ask, whether it's financial or follow us on social media or something like that. If you know anyone in the glioblastoma clinical space, we'd love to get in touch with them. So always end you know, with, with an ask. Um, so let's see, I think, yeah, you said something that was also, as we all know, leukemia is one of the major types of cancer. <laughs> Again, just like avoid that as we all know, because I, you yeah. know, I know it's prevalent, yeah. but I didn't know it was like the major type. <laughs> um, and you also said, you mentioned that it was children, which I assumed is like, you know, under 18, but then you said it was um, ages zero to 14 and then 15 to 19. So to mm -hmm. me, is it just zero to 19 or is there a specific age range within there that it's more uh, prevalent. And so I was just trying to understand what you meant by zero to 14 and 15 to 19. Uh, it's it's from zero to uh, 18, 19 basically total, all the children go. Okay, so you can probably save some time and you don't have to say zero to 19 because you're saying children already. So everyone is gonna assume under yeah. 18 is, you know, is, is the, the, the demographic yeah. that you're talking about. So I think you can save some time and. And, sure. and skip that uh, the age. Uh, I really appreciated the way you explained the problem. It was a great outline, and uh, I noticed small things like the color change from red to green when you produce the, the solution. Or the solution's green, but the problem is red. So I appreciate those those subtle nuances because it, it is very. I'm important. so happy you noticed it. You know, I'm so <laughs> so happy you noticed it. Yes, those, those subtle things really, really help. It just makes it, the presentation feel a little more warm. Like, okay, like this is bad, it's in my face, but in a, in a good way, because it's very intentional with the colors. So we do that all the time with subtleness and, and colors. So I, I loved it, it was great. Um, so in your slide, your competitor slide, you've mentioned your drug outperforms these other drugs. So has that been proven or is this something you're saying it's anticipated to outperform like, have you done all of these studies or is this something that you propose to do and you anticipate that this is gonna be the outcome? So basically our drug is, um, I mean, with respect to two current drugs, which has been available and three companies who tried to develop Protac, our response is uh, actually better than rest all of them. So, so is this, well, I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at here is, the, is the, this something that is, proven from studies because the way that you mentioned it, it was our drug outperforms you know the competition and you can say that but it's like with what backing or is this something that you did an analysis of like the drugs that are on the market and this is what they're missing and this is what we are bringing versus like we have data to outperform and we mm -hmm. this is so i'll just kind of understand like wh where you were uh, coming from on yeah that end. That, that's a great question so basically the patent has been filed before us uh, for different molecules of course not the same as ours and they tried to target jack2 before us but all the three patents we have gone through word to word from all the three patents by gsk kuljin and this particular company uh, none of them actually specifically targets jack2 and plus at the same time they have different off target effects which actually hampers more than actually degrading the jack2 and that's why we said that um, it outperforms. But, uh, I see yeah, but you, you haven't done like head-to-head -head studies, right? Yeah. Like on, yeah. on there. So I think it's, it's just something that they don't have these features and, and we do. This okay. is more of like a, 
like the, the, just the way that, that, that you would say it. I wouldn't change the slide at all. I think the slide makes sense. Um, but it's really just the way that, it, that you would say it rather than, you know, we, our product outperforms. Well, the only way to really show that is to, to have data. But what you can say is, you know, this is a competitive analysis and these are the deficiencies with other products. And this is what we're bringing to the table. You know, we, we check all of these. So I think, you know, what you're, just the, the way to, to say it may, um, it may resonate that, that's differently a great with, 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 yes. some, with some that's of the, a great the judges. So nothing to change on the slide here. I think it's just uh, a, a little bit of rewording there. I, um, I think, do you mind if I butt in real quick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so like with what he was saying, when you say picomolar activity, are you looking at the activity of these on like uh, an enzyme assay or are these done in cells or how are these done? I'm, I'm... These, these are done in cells as well as some of them are in mice as well. Okay, thanks. Yep. And question also on the slide real quick. Um, one of the value that you mentioned before is that you can give this orally, correct? Yes. But you also have systemic delivery on here as a competitive factor. Mm -hmm. Systemic, you mean by giving it IV versus giving it orally? Yes. So you can formulate. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead, Elika. I, I, so your your value, your competitiveness is in the fact that you can give it orally, not in the fact that it can be delivered the way everything else is delivered. Because if you're going to check every single thing there, I don't know that that's necessarily a competitive okay. advantage. It's Agreed. what everything else does. Agreed. Yeah, what you could do is if you want to say oral and systemic delivery, mm -hmm. then all of them are going to be well, I guess most of them are going to be X's. So I think that could be, because that is a value proposition. Yeah, because I thought it was only oral delivery, but then now I'm seeing systemic up there. I didn't even catch that. So to me, that's another value proposition is you, we are compatible with current treatments and we bring something new, which is through uh, like the oral bioavailability. So I would maybe even change that to like oral and systemic delivery, okay. which okay. I don't think anyone can do that. Maybe. Uh, yeah. So, I don't, but that, yeah, that's a great point. If, if it's going to be all check check marks, then just remove that line or figure okay. out a new way to to incorporate it. But sure. that that's pretty cool that it can be compatible with current standard of care, and you have another option of delivery. Sure. Very cool. Um, last comments I had were just around the like the licensing and and the and the royalties. So mm -hmm. for the first, yeah, here I would just remove the royalties part that's going back to St. Jude because that may not be the, the final structure that you have. It may just be a fee. It may be equity in the company. There's lots of ways that you can obtain the IP rights. So I think it's safe. You can just say, you know, we are going to obtain the IP rights unless you already, like you said, you've had the conversation and, and you're not going to get away from royalties, but it's likely going to be not just royalties, probably royalties and the fee and royalties and equity. So I think you can just if you are comfortable just removing it from there and still gonna say, you're still okay by saying we're gonna obtain ex exclusive uh, IP rights and no one needs to know like what are the negotiation that goes on behind the scene there. So, yeah. and for, for, for the next one where you had the, the other companies, it is okay to say that because that is what you're gonna be asking for, yeah. for the companies. We are gonna ask for royalties back. So that is perfectly okay because that's like your company and that's how you're gonna make money. Um, is is non-exclusive IP rights or, or non-exclusive IP rights, is that common in, this space, because I know, like in med device and wound and and other other areas, it's not common. They would prefer to have an exclusive license. So, uh, if it is common, then I would state it up front and say, you know, we're kind of following other products that are on the market by doing non-exclusive license. Or you can just say, you know, we're going to try to obtain non-exclusive license. But to me, it seems a little uh, far fetched that you're going to be able to, you know, get multiple companies online because they want to compete with each other. They want to be the only one to have the oral delivery of this drug. They want to be the only one. So. It's going to be a, a tough task to, to get more than one company involved on non-exclusive unless it's uh, unless it's it's common. Oh, and then add an L for exclusive there too. I just saw that. And to add exclusive. that, and to add to that, what will most likely happen is St. Jude will give you non-exclusive IP rights while they try to license it out to one of the big pharma companies. Since you're just a nobody right now, um, that is something that they've. They told me when I was in a similar situation a couple of years ago. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. You could work with St. Jude to, you know, to, to push this too. So yeah. Yeah. 
and then I guess the one thing I was missing was, I don't, I don't know if this is part of the, the template or not, but it was just any uh, like regulatory um, just conversation or, or topic and just saying we are going to pursue a PMA pathway, anticipate it's going to take this long and maybe total of $30 million over 10 years. And you know, just, just some sort of quick statement on what you anticipate the pathway is going to be. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's a great suggestion. It's time for a few but, more pieces of feedback. Take a few more minutes. Anybody else? Erica, Shelby, Isaac, Ryan? I was just going to add to what Isaac said earlier about the age group instead of like 0 to 14, mm -hmm. 14 to 19. All that's pediatric, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So just say pediatric. Sure. I wouldn't, yeah. So you don't have to describe all the ages and what they fit into child versus adolescence versus adult. And great job. <laughs> yeah, great job. And like I, I see this like clinical trial here in GMP manifest. So it's, like, it, it's touched on there. Um, but the, the pathway, I guess it's going to be obvious, but it's just saying the words like it's a PMA, you know, pathway. Okay. Okay. It, it's going to go, it's going to go a long way. Sure. Um, yeah, no, this that's, is, I mean, it, it's resonated very well. I mean, it, it was, that's, I like it. That's a great suggestion. A Thank bit. you so much, all. That's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. Why don't you practice it a little? Because you went over how how much was it? About a minute or so, Brian? Uh, it was eight minutes and twenty three seconds. Yeah. So once you get your your uh, verbiage down, like especially you spend a lot of time kind of describing the kids in the cafeteria and they have IVs and you kind of repeat it yourself a couple of times. Once you practice, you'll be able to kind of like stick to the script, so you're sure. not repeating and. I think you'll be able to get um, things down, but be cognizant of um, when you start to ramble a little bit and, it, and then you start repeating yourself. I do the same thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're halfway through our session tonight and have four more teams to go. So I'm going to start shortening up the feedback. Remember, each team's going to get another hour one on one. Um, uh, coming up. So uh, we'll, we'll start timing the feedback as well. All right. Thanks, team two. Uh, Y'all did great. Team four. Who's, uh, who's doing team four? Is that the thumbs up? I come on audio or off video from team four. If team four is Jessica, she may not be able to do it right. Yeah, she is team four. So she's yeah. dealing with some baby issues at the moment. Gotcha. Um, and it doesn't look like anyone else on her team is here. Okay. So Rohan was the next up. So we can just go with him. Then we'll come back when Jessica is, is back or take her offline if we need to. Uh, so, Ron, you ready? Sure. Um, Make can I share my screen? Yep. Making a co host now. Can you guys see my uh, screen? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Cool. Uh, All right. Yeah, I guess gonna... as usual. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to start the timer when you tell me to go. Uh, yeah, sure. I uh, want to point out, yeah, obviously, caveat, it's yeah, still in a pretty rough shape, especially compared to the nice work I just saw from the other two teams. But uh, I'll go ahead uh, anytime you're ready. Okay. You can go right now. Hi, I'm Rohan, and I'm here to tell you a bit about true tummy time. To talk about the problem, lack of prone play or tummy time in infants can really negatively affect their motor development. It can worsen and cause these flat spots that form on babies' heads. Uh, for this reason, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends at least 30 minutes of tummy time per day. But however, in a study of parents of infants, they found that over half of infants reported that they did not get this recommended 30 minutes of tummy time per day and over a third of them were intolerant of this slightly uncomfortable position. 
And so our market uh, and our customers uh, for our device are uh, these uh, babies. So over 13% of single babies and over 50% of twins are born with these partially flattened heads. It comes out to a population of over 4.8 million babies and 67,000 twins that have possibility to have these flat spots and not only have these flat spots, but have them worsen as they, they grow up. In addition, infants that are either born prematurely or born with the complications are even more likely to develop flat spots and have other developmental issues. And so it's a large population of babies that are at risk um, for not getting enough tummy time. Our solution is the true tummy time wedge solution. It's a unique system of support and engagement for babies during this developmental period. Our unique value proposition is it consists of two form-fitting wedges. These wedges are molded to fit the shape of the body of the baby. And this molded design shifts the weight to the hips, making this position more comfortable. In addition, it avoids the pinch points that are found in other competing devices, uh, which pinch at the sensitive area underneath the armpit region. In addition, it consists of different sizes to help grow along with the baby. We also include a play wedge, which includes both multi-sensory toys and a baby safe mirror. The purpose of this play wedge is to engage babies while they're in this position to make it more comfortable and distract them uh, from the slight uh, uh, uncomfortableness they have with this position initially and encourage them to stay in this position and develop the muscles necessary. In comparison to other products on the market, we have a number of unique advantages that our product proposes. Most importantly, our project, our, uh, our product is consists of this molded full body support, which none of the other products on the market have. In addition, it's the only product on the market that is actually supported by pediatrician research, which none of the other products again are supported by any sort of research backing. And as I mentioned before, we also avoid the pinch points that are present on all the other competing uh, products in the market. To try and take this uh, product to market, we're gonna target our primary customers, which are parents of infants under 12 months. To target these, this population, we have two different approaches. One, the direct approach, where we target parents directly, either via, you know, direct marketing, parenting groups, social media, et cetera. And then the other option is via the institution model. Since our uh, product is research supported, we can market our product through various institutions that work with babies, such as pediatric centers, daycare centers, uh, which really stands out compared to other competition that exists currently. Our business model consists of sort of scaling up the approach of making and selling uh, this product. Initially, we plan to have a short run of 100 prototypes, which will be made by hand, and they will be given away in exchange for feedback from parents uh, and how they get their use and how babies respond to this product. We will use the feedback from this initial stage of 100 prototypes to refine and improve the product uh, the next stage is to scale this up a little bit more and to make and sell the first set of a thousand prototypes. Uh, we'll sell these at a discounted rate, uh, both at different levels for institutions, as well as directly for parents. The future models involve potentially scaling this up with a manufacturing partnership, either with an established toy manufacturer or with some other general manufacturing company. As to talk about the revenue model, uh, the total baby product market is a huge market of over a uh, billion dollars. And the average household spends over 13,000 in the first year alone on baby related products. Uh, we plan to sell our product directly uh, at a cost of about $100 per product and use the difference between uh, the manufacturing costs, which are a lot lower, uh, the materials and labor costs should come to something around the $70 range and use that difference uh, to sell and get a profit from our product. Initially, as you can see on the right, our profits will be fairly low as we have, we'll be operating with a pretty low margin, but as we scale things up and potentially move to a manufacturing 
route, uh, we can expect to see more significant um, profits. Our progress so far, we've designed and developed a prototype the last two years. We've now received funding uh, to support a study to work with these products. Uh, we're currently in the process of rec recruiting uh, people for the study, and we're working through the Cyberpreneur Challenge to develop and design uh, our uh, go-to-market uh, plan. Our team consists of Dr. Zachary, uh, who's a professor and chair of occupational therapy. And she's the pediatric occupational therapist with over 20 years of experience who brings a lot to the table. And uh, me, Rohan Isaac, who's working on developing this uh, project and fleshing it out more. Our initial ask is just uh, $20,000 to develop uh, a fraction of the prototypes that I discussed. Uh, those costs will go into equipment and materials costs and some amount to R&D. Um, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Please reach out to us for if you're interested in more information. We're hoping to make tummy time safer and better for parents and infants alike. Thank you. Awesome, nice job. All right, I'll start off with um, some feedback. I, I think it, it flowed very well. I think you, you were you're further along than you give yourself credit for. <laughs> so that, oh, thank you, that I appreciate great. that. It sure. doesn't feel that way. But. <laughs> uh, one thing I was just trying to grasp was just the competition and mm -hmm. what is it like, if you could maybe even just, you know, have to go put pictures of the other solutions out there. Cause I'm trying to, I'm yeah. having a hard time understanding like what else is out there and how does that look? And is it just, clunky or is it like you said there's these areas that i'm just like oh i wouldn't put my kid on there so if there are pictures of the competition that are just like you look at it and you see immediately what's wrong you see yours is like oh that's so much better those visuals go um, okay all right i do have a good because most of the traditional products are a sort of c-shaped pillow mm -hmm. that sits underneath the uh so it's just really just a long pillow that's curved slightly mm -hmm. and i think that's a good suggestion i'll put that in the notes um oh that's a a pretty easy thing to add, but I, I yeah. think right. I'm not trying to have you change the presentation <laughs> crazy. No, no, absolutely. Normal, but that's, that's, that, that's just like a quick, quick ad. A hundred dollars per product is what you're looking to sell yours. How does that compare to what's on the market? So I would say that in your presentation too, it's a hundred dollars per product. Average competitor product is 50 or 150. So it doesn't, as long as you just have some sort of comparison, because I don't know if that's expensive or not. So just trying to understand yeah, it is, where it you is fit in. Relatively more expensive than some of the products. Uh, but I think, I mean, I don't think we've worked too hard on trying to sort of narrow down those numbers a little bit. I think the aim is it'll be slightly more expensive, but the trade-off is it's actually research-based right. and works and, you know, has more parts. Uh, but, okay, I'll put that comparison. Yeah, it's $100, you know, slightly above average, but we're providing, you know, so many more benefits. So it's okay that you're above the average because you are, you know, it's just okay to charge a premium because you are, you do have more, more features there. Um, so it looks like you're not making any claims in my last comment here. You're not making any claims so there's no like medical device uh, no, there shouldn't be pathway any here i guess what could be of interest is is there a possibility to make claims here because that could be a future where it's like if you can make a claim then you could go down a device route and then this is like your first of course spend your first year two or three doing this get you know the revenue projections it's like hey we can grow and then we can look at making claims for this device and actually claim that we are improving uh, you know, the motor development of these children okay. where, so that, that could just be an interesting way that if, um, to get a medical device investor on board, like for us, we submitted our product without antibacterial data, just because it's why get that up front, we can just get to the FDA first and then we build upon it. So it could be an, an interesting way to um, think about, it. you don't have to put it in your slide, but it's just like a quick comment. Yeah, like, no, that's that, a, that could grow into a potential. Cool. Make little things to have at least in my back pocket. Yeah. I'll pass it off to everyone else for, for feedback, but it, it, it flowed very nicely. Thank you. I appreciate it. First, Rohan, you didn't name the baby. Oh, I forgot to <laughs> name the baby. I forget. Did we? You had a name for him. Oscar. 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 That was Oscar. little Timmy. What happened to little Timmy? Timmy. Oh. All right. We have some baby names. I'll, I'll put an <laughs> Timmy. Timmy's baby. fine. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan said Timmy's. <laughs> <laughs> little Timmy. Little Timmy's mine. But Rohan, I, I loved your, your progress slide. I think that was great how you had the arrow starting off sort of small and in the oh, background thanks. and yeah. then it progressed sort of in your face and big and bold. I, I really like that how you did that. So good job there. 
Um, on your market slide, I think it was your second slide. I just had a question about the statistics. Are those global statistics for 4.8 million babies or is no, that the U.S.? Those are all the U.S. So they're taken really? from the uh, CDC. So they're just for the U.S. alone and it's for the 2019 year. So Wow, that's um, extremely compelling. I would really emphasize that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't didn't want to emphasize it too much because it turns out, you know, if babies do get even some amount of tummy time, right, there's a chance that they will grow out of it. A lot of those spots sort of uh, disappear. Um, don't say that. that alarmist, say that. But it, it is sort of a concern. Um, yeah. Right, okay, um, I'll, I'll highlight that that uh, data a bit more though, because yeah, it is, I feel like there, yeah, there's a lot of people that who, are, who should be concerned, definitely. Yeah, I think, you, I think you're way more polished than you give yourself credit for, like Isaac said. Yeah, I agree. Oh, can you go through the uh, next slide? Yep. Uh, uh, tell me when to stop. Competition, go back to competition. Was there something I was going to say here? Oh, yeah. sorry, competition, yeah. Yeah. And I, was, I was waiting for you to meet the comment, Erica. Go ahead. <laughs> the multi, well, we actually talked about this with Rohan the other day, the multi-sensory oh, yeah. toys. Oh, um, yeah. All of them have multi-sensory toys, so. Oh, um, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I had some notes on this that I have not removed yet. Do you want to mention, like, you know, you have a more variety of, you know, higher variety of multi-sensory toys that actually involve all the sense, you know, like you have touch, feel, you know, all, if, if you're saying that you provide more sensory um, stimulation yeah. to the, to the baby, then that's definitely, um, I, I would say something like that because okay. all, right. get all the rest of them out. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to, I seem that there's so many points in here. I didn't want to dwell too much on a bunch of different ones. That's why I just picked out a couple to, to talk about. Right. Um, you could say I mean, like, you could say five plus multi-sensory toys and then yours has a check and everyone else has an X. Maybe one other person has a check. So that's a way to, to oh, have okay, the X's right. in there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, more than five sensory toys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be completely honest, I don't think that the toys really themselves are adding as much as the fact that the toys are in a position that actually encourages prone play. I think that's really the selling point. Whereas a lot of them have it on the on the same thing that they're supposed to be sitting on. So they will never use both of them at the same time. If that well, there is an advantage, if there's one that only has two and it only makes noises versus if you have six and they have different uh, yeah. fabrics that allow them to develop sensation or hearing or different flashing of lights, like that's actually really important because you're trying to get the baby to the milestones and you're doing that a little bit with your, with the toys that you provide on the, on the um, pillow or whatever. So. Um, I think that is an important point, but I just would try to figure out a way to bring that out a little bit better. All right, I, I see what you're. We're, I mean, I'll, I, I think I, I see what you guys are, are talking about. I'll, I'll try to pull that out a little more. Um, but great job. Oh, thanks. Uh, I had a lot of help from Shelby yesterday um, in refining this. That was extremely helpful as well. Nice. Okay, good job, Rohan. Uh, Rohan, sorry, I don't know why I said Rohan. Rohan. Uh, <laughs> It's yes, all right I don't there. know where that's coming Worst from. Worst place people have butchered that. Name. I'm doing like six things at once trying to test things. I've already heard y'all's decks. I know how great they are. So I've been letting other people do fact why I'm testing out things for next Thursday night. You nailed it though, man. You were at, right at seven minutes. So uh, you can give yourself a, a, a you know big slap on the back for that one, pat on the back for that one, maybe even take a couple more seconds if you need to. Uh, but otherwise, you're spot on on time. Sounds good. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, you're good. Thank you, sir. All right. Team one, you're next. Hey, hi, Brian. Uh, who said Can hi? you hear me? Yeah, Pandora, I got you. Um, I'm going to make you the co host. Yeah, I will share my screen. And when you're up and ready, we'll start the time. Can you see my screen? Yep, Dogma Bio. Yep. Okay, so let's start. Hello everyone, I am Pandurang Kolekar from Team One. And today we are presenting our scientific business venture, Dogma Bio. Let's start with a problem statement. Sorry. 
when it comes to the late stage of cancer, patients and families have to go through lots of hardship while fighting for survival. This family from Canada is spreading awareness by sharing its life-changing experience due to early diagnosis of their child. It has been shown that liquid biopsy methods are very useful in early diagnosis of cancer. It not only increases the survival rate, but also improves the quality of life. This can bring a life-changing experience for millions of patients around the world. Different types of cancers in their various stages of growth release tumor DNA in the blood. These blood samples are then subjected to DNA sequencing to detect specific mutations, which help in decision of treatment. Therefore, liquid biopsy can be used for early diagnosis and to monitor the drug response during treatment. However, during early stages of diagnosis and relapse, the proportion of cancer cells in blood go down below 0.1%, making it a very challenging problem like finding a needle in a haystack. Sequencing errors further adds to the complexity in detection of low frequency true mutations from background errors. This significantly limits the accuracy of liquid biopsy methods in early diagnosis. The standard analysis methods fail to distinguish such low frequency mutations from sequencing errors. To overcome this challenge, we developed a novel solution uh, for systematic separation of sequencing errors to such an extent that mutations with frequency as low as 0.05% can easily be detected. This significantly improves the accuracy of liquid biopsy methods in early diagnosis. Yeah, I'm getting this timer on. Yeah. So our methods will be helping researchers to solve this needle in a hashtag problem. Using our solutions, we could also detect the drug resistant mutations about four months earlier in leukemia patients. Such a level of advances in early detection help clinicians to develop effectively new treatment for the patients, giving them hope for better survival and quality of life. Though the main beneficiaries of our solution will be cancer patients, we will be targeting major liquid biopsy companies like Grail and Garden Health as our customers. Subsequently, we plan to serve hospitals and cancer research centers with various applications of liquid biopsy methods. In a nutshell, our methods offer 100x better accuracy for early diagnosis, and we offer three times more cost-effective solutions with significantly lower turnaround time for analysis, which means a early diagnosis, better quality of life, and increased survival rate for our patients. Currently, Grail, Foundation Medicine, and Garden Health are the major players in the liquid biopsy industry. However, in terms of separation of error rate, Dogma Bio shows 100x better performance. This further helps to achieve a limit of detection as low as 0.01% compared to 0.1% by Grail and others. Dogma Bio further doesn't require UMI-based redundant sequencing. Thus, the cost of sequencing, data storage, and analysis time is much lower compared with other companies. These all features uniquely provide an unfair advantage to Dogma Bio in early diagnosis of cancer. Our metrics and claims are supported by our published papers in repeated journals. We plan to utilize digital marketing tools such as websites, email marketing, and SEO techniques. We will leverage the scientific articles and white papers for B2B content marketing to major liquid biopsy companies. And we will use social media platforms, blogs, and newsletters to create awareness among customers and the general public. As part of field marketing, we will participate in scientific conferences organized by major cancer societies. We will sponsor webinars to share the applications and success stories of our products. This will definitely help us to generate leads and have face-to-face -face meetings with our potential customers. This way, we will continue to penetrate into markets with new products. We plan to employ B2B business model with software as a service. Our software solutions will be deployed in a secure, scalable, and compliant cloud infrastructure. Our customers, such as liquid biopsy companies, hospitals, research centers, will be uploading sequencing data from a number of liquid biopsy samples using interactive interface or in an automated manner. Dogma Bio solution will then process the data and provide highly accurate reports to test to the customers in a timely manner. Currently, on an average, we plan to charge $10 per sample with an estimated processing cost of $4. Our pricing strategy is subject to change with respect to factors such as competitors, priority of the analysis, length and size of the contract, and additional services. Currently, 
patients visits major hospitals and research centers for diagnosis and treatment. This organization in turn used the liquid biopsy services from the major companies like Grail and Garden, which analyze about 200,000 samples per year. With the vision of B2B model, initially Dogma Bio will target these major companies and subsequently hospitals and research centers, thus ultimately benefiting our customers, our patients. The number of cases of cancer are expected to increase up to 28 million by 2040, and the liquid biopsy market will rise up to 5,000 million US dollar by 2027. Thus, by assuming that we acquire 50,000 samples in the first year of launch, and with 10 to 20% growth in subsequent years, estimates show that our revenue can grow up to $2 million in five to six years. The upcoming even innovative products with acquisition of new customers will further boost the revenue generation. Our methods have been published in repeated journals. We have also filed an international patent based on these scientific innovations. Currently, two core software solutions are production ready and can be used to demonstrate their value to customers. Moving forward, the development of scientific methods and commercialization will be closely connected between MALAB at St. Jude and Dogma Bio. Currently, we are optimizing our product SeqWatcher to target companies like Illumina and Sequencing Labs for calibration of DNA sequencing instruments. We are also developing methods for accurate detection of structural variants and indels, which can be released next year. This year, we will begin the design and deployment of our website and cloud infrastructure. Along these lines, we have reached our domain dogmabio.com. Marketing content and campaigns will be carried out simultaneously. In the long term, we plan to develop an integrated solution with software and instrumentation support for early diagnosis. To achieve these goals, we are looking for 400,000 in funds to complete product development, cloud deployment, beta release of software, office setup, and to hire key staff members. Our Dogma Bio team with four members has a collective experience of close to 40 years. Dr. Shautuma is an assistant member at St. Jude with expertise in statistics. He'll be serving as a scientific advisor to Dogma Bio. Dr. Pandurang Kolekar is a bioinformatics research scientist and will primarily undertake product management roles along with marketing. Dr. Kori Zhu is a senior bioinformatics research scientist at St. Jude and will take care of project management, operations, and marketing. Ms. Narin Mirza holds MS and MBA and currently pursuing PhD at University of Memphis. Her experience will be useful in marketing, finance, and operations. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, again, these are I'm, I'm able to follow these uh, pretty well. So, you know, congrats on, on getting it uh, to this far. Um, let's see. I think I mean you have a very compelling story to tell. It's it's something that I think you you start off strong, and then at the end, I would also bring it back to the beginning. You know, we talked about that family from Canada that was, it's a, it's a life-changing, uh, like, this, not this, this life-changing information that you're getting, right, for, for that entire family. So it's what happens if that decision is, like, if, if the test is wrong where it doesn't detect it, like you said, but it is there, like, that's even more catastrophic because now you're right. not, you know, so I think just, like, you can hammer that home a little bit more. Mm -hmm. at, at the end, especially, is just like highlight the catastrophic nature of just not getting it right the first time because you're losing precious time for treatment. And I, th I think that is why you guys you know, are doing what you're doing. So you have a very strong story to tell. You started off strong uh, with, with that personal story or the, with the Canada family story. Like I remember that. And then just end with that too. Even bring that family back and just say like, we want more families like this across the globe. That, so it's just like you're, you're having the sandwich of information around this personal story or around the story of the family. So, you know, I, I would use words that are unacceptable like this, you know, the current, you know, the detection limits are unacceptable and with technology, we are able to, you know, to, to push it forward. So uh, I love the story. Um, I, I didn't really understand exactly your solution until you got to the, I think it, I wanna write down the business slide. Uh, sorry, the, um, until you got to the business model slide, then I started understanding, okay, like what you're, what you're actually, um, you know, what, what you were doing. Cause at first I thought, were you a different liquid detection? Are you compatible? Are you not liquid, but you're something else? So I was just trying to figure out what your solution was, which is hard for me to kind of put context with what you were already presenting with when I, when I wasn't sure what the solution was. So maybe if it's even upfront, we are, uh, you know, Dogma Bio, a software solution that, mm -hmm. 
that the, the text at a higher act, like one sentence, what, what is your, okay. what is your company that okay. would really set the tone because with everyone else presenting, it could be more of the, the life science side, but you're more of the, the cloud based and the tech side. So, and that may go for everyone too, just a one sentence company. We are, right. you know, sweet bio, we manufacture medical devices, leveraging Manuka honey to help different types of wound heal. Got it. Like not, now I know what, what, you, what you all do. Just a great way to set the stage. Um, Strong go-to-market slide. I think that was, that I really appreciated that. It was uh, very well thought out. Uh, one thing, my last comment here, just, just to mention if there's any sort of regulatory involved, I'm assuming there's gonna be some sort of like HIPAA compliance with storing patient data and yeah. everything. So just a nod to it, yeah, compliant up there. Just like, you're gonna have to take some time to have to figure that out, work with people and make sure that you store it and everything. So I think it's, it's understood that you're gonna have it there, but it may be something that, you can get a question on, which is fine. So I see it there in, in, in there, but when you're talking about when we're, when we're with the cyberpreneur challenge, it's like, there's typically some sort of like regulatory, whether that right. is the FDA or right. not, there's some sort of like quality involved in what you're doing. So I feel like the, the judges historically have been asking about, well, what is your, what are the hurdles from a regulatory standpoint or like reimbursement standpoint, like how are you gonna get paid? So um, it's okay if you don't talk about it here, but that likely will be a question if you don't talk about it, or you could just say, you know, we will we'll make this uh, HIPAA compliant and protect all the, even though it's obvious, it is something that's just like, people are looking for as a check mark that you understand that, you know, you're not, it, what you need to go through. So I think um, that was all the comments I had, uh, except for one, one last one, just on the cost is, I think you said $10 per sample. Yeah, right there on the bottom left. Is that expensive? Is are everything else a dollar a sample? Is everything else twenty dollars a sample? So I don't know where it falls in that range. So you, again, you could say we're gonna be in in the standard of around ten dollars, or we're gonna charge a little bit more because we're faster service, or we're actually right. better service and we're a better price. So just yeah. give the audience some sort of understanding on on if it's uh, less expensive, more expensive, or on average. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the inputs. Sure. No problem. Thank you for the presentation. So I said the same thing to Brad earlier today, but on your ask, if you're going to ask for $400,000, be very specific what you need that $400,000 for. Um, I know you have a cost structure breakdown there, but it may be better, unless you know all those specifically, it may be better to ask for less. I think um, historically for this competition, the judges who some of them are investors like to see smaller asks Mm -hmm. and use and know exactly what you want to use that money for to get for get through the next several months until you get to the next part of whatever milestone you're trying to hit um but yeah, you know if you know here. exactly what you need those four hundred thousand dollars for then then so be it yeah when we worked with the team this past week i mean this one in particular needs development resources and those can be costly and it's more than a few or it's, maybe it's a few uh, so it could be this high, uh, and I don't want the, just, you know, not to disagree necessarily, but I don't want a team to shortchange what they're asking for if it is legit. Your point is completely solid, Ryan, is like be able to defend it with detail. Um, and I think that was the ultimately, you know, the point you're trying to make is if you're going to ask for it, that's okay. They might look at that and go, my goodness, but you need to say, and this, I'm talking directly to the team here, you need to be able to say exactly what it's for and it's for development resources and you know they're expensive then you say we're going to be hiring four developers to finish out this right. next milestone uh, and that's why we have a bulk of it you know 43 percent going to new hires so on and so forth thanks real quick can you go to the second slide where the patient the story you're telling Oh, yeah, this yeah, one. here. So um, the numbers, after I look at them, stand out to me. I don't know that I necessarily appreciate it. I appreciated the story you were telling, but for if you can do something to make those numbers stand out underneath the people, like 90% die, 90% live in this situation, right? <clears throat> that's what that's what I get from this. So if you're you're diagnosed in stage four, 90% of people are going to die. If you're diagnosed in stage one or two, 90% of people are gonna live. So okay. um, if, if there's a way that you can actually highlight that or something and make that stand out, um, because that is literally very compelling um, you know, information 
and, and, and hits home when you see that. And then the last thing I was going to say real quick, go back down um, a little bit. I'll have to tell you when to stop on the slide real quick. Ben? Keep progressing down the slides. She'll tell you when to stop, I think. <clears throat> Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Thank you. On this slide, you were saying numbers that I didn't know what you were like referring to. So maybe like the last one you said estimated revenue, the one thing that you said out of all of these numbers on that part was the 2.5 million. Again, like lots of numbers going on, maybe highlight it, circle it, point to it, put yellow background on it or something like that to make us focus on the most important numbers on here mm -hmm. that you're talking about each yeah. time. That's great points. We will do that. Yeah. Okay. And that's it. Great job. Okay. Yeah, you. great job, team. Y'all are right at seven minutes and 50 seconds. I, oh. Knowing that, I might not pull you, you know, send out the big hook, the stage hook, but I would like y'all to shave about 20 to 30 seconds off your pitch. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We'll improve on the time. Thanks. Right. Cause, I mean, so these last two pitches, uh, practice we've done where you know it's we've gone over by 30 minutes to an hour depending on what night it was for the pitch event we're going to really need to try to stay on time we only have an hour and a half we're trying to respect everyone's time both the audience and the panelists so you know we're going to be very much sticking to those so uh, you know work the magic to get it below seven minutes or right at seven minutes mm -hmm. okay Thanks. Good job, guys, and everybody. That was uh, another great presentation. You all made some good progress. Thank you for including or implementing a lot of the changes that we all gave you the other day. So really appreciate that. So a lot of those changes in place. All right, team three. Brad, you here? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna trip over myself halfway through this, but uh, all right. I can guess that. Give me this to say I'm ready when you are. We see your slides. Uh, I was just editing a second ago, so they're not correct, but I'm going to just try to hit seven minutes or under seven minutes and uh, yeah, work a lot this clock. weekend, like we talked about. All right, you ready? Yep, go. All right, so my name is Brad, and uh, our company is called Kaizen Innovation. Um, so this is James, and he, he came home today from the hospital thinking about a very difficult question that his son asked him. You know, he, he looked at his bandage and he reflected on, on his whole life that he's been fighting diabetes. And he thought to himself, he said, I hope not, son. I really hope not. And 34 million Americans have diabetes. And if uncontrolled neuropathy and poor sick circulation set in, there's no feeling in your feet you can soon find an ulcer uh, unbeknownst to you. And 50% of those become infected and 20% lead to amputation. 73,000 lower limbs are amputated every single year due to diabetes in the US alone. Um, so our solution at Kaizen Innovations is called the complete bandage. We combine all of the existing costs and, and products that are typically needed in a current diabetic foot ulcer treatment into one device in hopes of improving healing while decreasing costs. And our unique value is combining mother nature with human innovation, AKA Kaizen Solutions with University of Memphis Intellectual Property. Um, and Kaizen is made from the exoskeletons of shellfish. It has a lot of the properties listed before of being antimicrobial, antibacterial, 
uh, hemostatic and biocompatible and degradable. The U of M intellectual property that we own combines Kaizen, polyethylene glycol, and anesthetic agents, as well as film and sponge compositions. And we plan to file an application which combines both the sponge, polyethylene glycol, anesthetic, and a bandage connection to the body. And our competition is pretty fierce in the wound care market. There's a lot of uh, people that are doing great work in this field. And um, it's gonna be hard to stand out, but we think we have a good solution that we're hoping with studies can show improved healing by having an anesthetic loaded with a hemostatic, antimicrobial, antibacterial, chitazan, uh, as the wound contacting uh, portion of the bandage, including skin attachments. So you don't have to spend the extra money to hold a covering onto the wound itself. Let's see, so our market attack strategy, we listed a couple action items, but to summarize, we plan to get an FDA class two 510K submission and attack the diabetes foot ulcer wound care market with that clearance. Um, like I said, there is extreme competition in the wound care market. And so you really have to show that you're differentiated or your costs are lower, like most hospital systems are concerned. And we think we can make it by showing the US cost savings of this solution, which combines multiple products. Our business model has an average sales price of $250 with a cost of $40 excluding any NRE fees. Um, using those rough numbers, it gives us a profit margin of about 86.2%. Um, and estimates of the US diabetic foot ulcer yearly spending averages around 10.6 billion uh, according to some studies. And the number in the US of the yearly patients um, is 2.25 million. And if you do some simple math, it, it adds up to $4,700 cost per patient in the US for treating diabetic foot ulcer wounds. Um, and here's our revenue model. We, we listed some metrics that we think are crucial to hit certain sales targets once we receive FDA clearance, but we can go into detail on that uh, if anybody has any questions. Um, so progress and traction so far, we have been awarded multiple research grants through the University of Memphis for Kaizen Research, which has been proven and published on its bio properties, characteristics, and benefits. We have two granted active U.S. patents that are protecting portions of our commercialized product or that we plan to commercialize. And we've hired four driven, action-oriented, uh, hopeful people to lead this company to success. And we've determined key metrics and identified top-line company objectives to get us there. Uh, our ask today is XX comma XXX, according to Ryan Hughes. <laughs> I guess I, don't, I can't back it yet, um, but we, we will have that ready by next week. Um, and we listed some objectives for each each round that we have um, and ignore the numbers on the slide. So our ask is 48, I'll see, we could put this together then. Uh, all right, stumbling through. <laughs> Here's our co-founder team and responsibilities uh, for each of us. We have Dr. Amber Jennings, who is our subject matter expert on Kaizen research and has done a lot of work in the field. Um, with the University of Memphis and her career to find those out and the rest of our team and their responsibilities uh, listed below. Um, and here's our advisory board. Um, I think we just had one missing. I think there was supposed to be a big Isaac right in the middle that I forgot to add uh, uh, as long as I get his permission. Uh, and so to wrap it up, Hopefully I'm under seven minutes, but here's our problem core value proposition and summary with our ask today. 
Thanks. Pissing up to the panel is not allowed next week, by the way. <laughs> Just very subtle. <laughs> awesome. Well, good to see you again, Brad. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, good to see you, Isaac. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that first yeah. problem statement, that's, that's it's, it's a great story to tell because it's an, unfortunately so common that it's people's grandparents, you know, parents, eventually themselves, potentially your neighbors. This is like such a prevalent disease. So I think you also like right. your teams kind of have, you have some oomph behind what you can, how you can connect with the audience from a personal side uh, there too. Some so, hook. Some hook, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, this is, yeah, this is my wheelhouse. So I won't get into details because I don't think that's the important part here, but the important part I think is uh, understanding, connecting your regulatory pathway to the claims you want to make. Uh, so FDA 510K yeah. pathway, yeah. Like you won't be able to get all those claims. You will likely have to be a right. de novo or a combination product and, and not just a traditional 510K. But if you are just addressing that soaks up others like an antibacterial solution and you are the delivery vehicle for that, then you could be yeah. a 510K. So I was just trying to connect the dots on, okay, well, if you're making all these claims and you're trying to get a 510K, that, that likely won't work out unless there's something that I was missing with like drug loading right. separately. Because you'd have to get, you have to lobby with CMS to get specific reimbursement, if, you know, if, if it doesn't even exist, right? With like in the wound care market. So that was the other comment. Yeah, and just if same for all, all the teams, just the reimbursement side is just, yeah, if it's not patient pay, uh, which patients will not pay yeah. $250 for this because the population that is uh, that have diabetes aren't the most affluent. So $250 and it's likely right. a multiple time treatment, potentially. It's not just like a one-time product that you would use. It would degrade and you would want to put more on if you needed it. So it's $1,000 maybe over, over the cycle. But that is the major hurdle in, in wound care is, is reimbursement. So if you're a $10 or a $30 product, it's really easy. You get an A code. If you're a thousand dollar skin substitute amniotic product, then you can, you can get a Q code. Yeah. Um, so 250, there's really no home for that today. You can try to get like a low bucket Q code, but it's still in there. So I would just highlight that, you know, you don't have to go into the details here, but just highlight that reimbursement. Once you want to get yeah. through the FDA, you, it's going to be difficult to sell. That's and the next hurdle. That. Reimbursement. The next hurdle is yeah, the yeah. other governmental body, which is the which is CMS, <laughs> and we would be applying for you know, a code uh, for you know for a low bucket Q code, something like that would would, would make sense. But just yeah, just like you said, recognizing that it, it is going to be a a hurdle. Uh, one thing that I caught, I think, towards the end, which, which took me by surprise from your presentation, was the vet market. I think was part of yeah. your early launch, which is like part <laughs> of the. It just kind of came out of nowhere for me. Yeah. I understand it and I agree with it. It makes sense. But when I read that, I was like, okay, well, so are you going to try to, as part of the, the funding that you're asking for, for veterinary launch, or is it for this medical device? And are you going to be distracted? You know, so just trying to understand right. that if that's going to be there, then I would highlight it because it is in the early milestone. Like the first tranche, I think of funding you were going to use was, was to get through the FDA within the first year. And then also do the vet market, which are two very, very different things. So just um, if it's going right. to be there, then maybe just say just just some uh, a plan around that because that that to me just threw me off a little bit. But I, I can agree with the plan. I just wasn't sure if that's where the funding was going um, for for the vet launch because the most gotcha. of the presentation was on. Did, did you guys try to go to vet market? Ryan Hughes was explaining. I guess we we had a presentation earlier today, a couple hours I guess ago. And I was going to take this out because, like you said, it, it can be like distracting or, or kind of take some of your focus away. Because so, Ryan yeah. was explaining to me, it's like not very easy to do both. Like it's pretty much a full gung ho. Like we're going vet market or we're two going, businesses. you know, right? Yeah. Like what? What are your thoughts? Yeah, two, two, two business. I, I would take it out for this presentation, and if it comes up in a question, then you can say like we can de-risk uh, the FDA process by shifting to go into veterinary while we wait to hear back from the FDA. So it can be like a, an answer to a strategy. Um, yeah, we, we've dabbled in the vet market. We treated a racehorse a few weeks ago. So we're like kind of in vet, oh, but wow. not actively. It is just kind of on the side. Uh, they don't, there's no yeah. FDA requirements there. Not just oversight, no, no clearances, but I would keep it gotcha. out or as part of a de-risking strategy in here is like, hmm. we have the option to go to go to the veterinary 
outside. And I never but know. Those like, are my I, I guess me and Brian. Yeah, thanks for those and thanks for your thoughts and uh, taking the time as well. Um, well. I guess I had one last question for you while, while you're on the line. Like me and Brian were talking about this. Like, what, what's your opinion on having a slide in your deck that basically shows other market potentials and future applications and basically like growth and run rate where you can take the, you know, your solution to a bunch of different applications and like showing that on a pitch deck, you know, to investors, like what's your experience with that? What's your opinion? Yeah, I think, I think there's a place for it. And if it's almost like a late night infomercial, it's like, but wait, there's more. And you don't want to get distracted by that more. Uh, but it, I think there is a place yeah. where you can just say like, this is where we're targeting, you know, diabetic. I just did this whole presentation on diabetic foot ulcers, but here's where we can go. And then we yeah. can go into vet orthopedic, uh, spine, sports medicine, internal surgery, things like that. So you, you, you can, yeah. uh, you, you can, but for this presentation, it may make sense to stay focused or you can just have a nod and just say like, yeah. you know, there are other applications that we can go into outside of so I think you don't have to put it in as a slide. I don't think it, it, it should warrant its own slide, but it does make sense to show how versatile you are. It's like, we're starting in, in these wounds, but we can go across the body. And it could be a simple mm, okay. three set, three second, you know, we can, we're starting right. in diabetic. And if somebody wants to ask about it. The body. All right. right, right. Okay, sweet. Well, I appreciate it, Isaac. thanks. You were at yeah, uh, no, six sorry. minutes and 54 seconds, uh, which is, it was good. But when you put your narrative together, not bad, not bad. the rest of the slides. Fred, let me ask just a real quick question. I'm not understanding the scenario, though. Like the words. Yeah. You, what, is, what are you trying to get at? <laughs> yeah, yeah change like the it, first. I like the concept, but I just don't understand what the, the narrative. I was thinking the same thing when I was changing these first three slides to kind of get the hook, like, like you guys were describing earlier on our call this morning. And, uh, and then I got to the solution and I was like, oh, this didn't really match up anymore. Cause like I was originally focused on decreasing cost and not really like no, having no, that no, hook I mean, with a personal slide. story. Yeah, the, yeah, slide. exactly. This slide particularly, um, if you're trying to like, if there's a narrative here, I don't know that the points that you put on here, I'm not connecting. What, what is the question that is on it? What's the question that's on this slide? Yeah. James came home today from the hospital thinking about the difficult question his son asked him. I guess I'm what? really just trying to focus on like the amputation, you know, ending on this next slide, like down here. You know, maybe I need to like well, I didn't up gather from the problem. first slide that he had an amputation, except for the fact that I looked at his foot. It's covered. I don't know that it was kind of half. Right. Uh, okay. Maybe okay. Say that. I gotcha. Say, yeah. Put that in the wording because right now I'm like, what question did he ask him? And mm, I, hope okay. done, I hope not, but I'm not even sure what that's related to. Just make that flow, but so I love it's it. It's kind of, it was ambiguous to you because I didn't explicitly say that. And it was kind of looking at the picture, it didn't make the connection. Right. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, I had a problem okay. with this problem slide, actually. Um, not, not a major problem, yeah. uh, you know, but it was, you know, you, we just talked about this a few hours ago. So you really haven't, put a heck of a lot of thought into any one of the, you know, this area in particular. Uh, and so you didn't have enough time to do All that. Right. And so it, the sale of the idea and the concept sounded, it fell flat for me. And I was like, well, I doubt he knows this guy. I'm sure he probably made this up. And that's what we asked you to do is to kind of build an anecdote or an avatar or someone that represents right. just my point to that is All right. You're going to have to sell whatever this anecdote or avatar, this representation, this personification of the problem you're gonna have to really sell it, right? And speaking truths is always easier to sell than making things up. I mean, when I used to, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm really not attacking you. I'm really explaining my, you know, the background for this is like, when I call yeah. Tim, I won't call him Tim, oh, yeah, I call yeah. him Tim uh, the real estate agent uh, that I made up for my last presentation, it's really easy to talk about him as a generic real estate agent. You know, his name is Tim. That's the only specifics I'm really giving, but I'm talking about character traits of a person more than Tim himself. You know, here, I agree with Erica a lot. There was a disconnect between this and the other one. And I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, chalk that up to that. You just really haven't had time to kind of think about the hook and you did a good job. I think you're on your way to getting where you need to be. You just need to really sell it, you know, 
and maybe not talking about a conversation about someone you don't know um, is less probably, yeah, right. uh, you know, it's probably, it's probably better to speak more factually and truthfully and representing this person as a typical type of customer of yours, right? If you want to interview me offline, I literally am going through this right now with my father who just came out yeah. of the hospital. The same scenario. Oh, so we can, I can, I can, I would, you can ask yeah. me questions. I can tell you exactly how that should look. Based well, then off you of just my turn friends. Erica's, you turn your friends, you know, I have a colleague, I have a I friend. I was literally about to say father. that. <laughs> right. And so now you have a reason to talk about facts because Erica is going to share That's her experience perfect. and then you can do that. And then now you're going to sell it because Eric's going to tell you about reality of this person that she, you know, her father. And I think that's going to be, that's going to tie it all in very, very well. And then I agree with Eric again, just make sure you, whatever example you're using, this is goes for everybody for your avatar, your anecdote, you know, the person that you're personifying with, make sure that does translate directly into the, you know, when you're actually starting to more talk more specifics about the problem or the customer that's affected by the problem. So, I mean, if you're highlighting amputation and open wounds and everything else, then you need to have that next slide kind of represent the same thing, right? So there's a congruency between the, the, the topics and the narrative. So you, uh, you're you at six minutes and 54 and... seconds. I'm not trying to move on. We'll open it up for more questions from Ryan or, or comments. But, uh, you know, so 654 with you still working on your narrative, you, I mean, you're right at the mark. So, you know, just be careful not to go ahead and, you know, go and expand it to eight or nine minutes at this point. Uh, but you're you're kind of right on the money. I right. wouldn't say I agree with the, the stretch goal and the stretch slide. And we talked about this and you got confirmation from Isaac as well. But I would not put that in here. Because it's it, it's it's just not the right time, place, nor the round, amount of time you have to present to kind of add that to it. Yeah, and then I had a just a real minor comment on your advisory board slide. Um, have you reached out to all of those people and asked them to be advisors yeah. for this? Um, because the reason why I say that is it's very possible that many of them will be there next Thursday. And so if you present an advisory board of people that you haven't asked, they may be <laughs> scratching their heads thinking I don't need to this guy. Yeah, that could be an issue. Yeah. Um, and really you don't you don't really need to have it for this presentation. I, I mean obviously Brian's on on your advisory board and I made the comment earlier that that's okay. Um, and you can even ask like you just did ask Isaac. But those other people, I mean, I don't know if it, I mean, I know John Bobango probably won't be there, but some of those other people. Yeah. Dr. Haggard, Bumgarner. Um, Dr. Haggard's actually retired from U of M, I believe. Yeah. But, no, yeah. Thanks Bumgarner's for that point. I'll, I'll uh, yeah. for sure. Any, any, any other feedback from anybody? Yeah, just make sure you go through and take out band-aid that's the only thing i was gonna say <laughs> there were a couple spots where you still had it on there so yeah. i'm sure you're yeah i checked trademark and it's it's a mile mile long <laughs> band -aid. I, did too. I, was, I did too after we got off the call uh they have they have quite a quite a quite a large USTPTO uh presence there uh but yeah i'm glad you yeah. came up with another another name though um you know, and it doesn't mean you can't say the word brand aid. You just can't make claims and you certainly can't put it in your thing is you can use them as a competitor. You can talk about them as just another vendor. Everybody knows band aid and the word is almost, you know, yeah. like, like Xerox and FedEx at this point. So, uh, um, so anyway, good job. I think you made even some good progress, solid progress from just earlier today when we talked to you. So, um, uh, good job. I appreciate it, Brian. And thank you guys. Okay, well, uh, we are not going to do team four tonight. There is a, a little bit of a situation and uh, everything's good. She's uh, just not able to present tonight. We're going to work with her online, give her uh, the time she needs and her team needs to, to work with that before next Thursday. So we're done for the evening. Uh, I thought everybody did great. Really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to have to, you know, ensure that we stick to time next week. So when we it's going to be less casual, less walkthrough, obviously, and we're going to be presenting this as an actual event. Uh, 
And so you just need to stand by. We'll be sending y'all messages through either text or chat. We'll work out on all the key, all the process to do this to make sure you know the order. Uh, we have selected the order. My cat did it randomly. I put a bunch of numbers on the on the table and just counted which ones he stepped on first. And uh, we'll release that information uh, shortly. In fact, if I have it right here, I'll go ahead and do that if everybody wants to hear it. So here's the official order for next Thursday. I'll put this again in email. Uh, team six, team two, team three, team one, team four, and team five. That's the order. So top is first off is team six, then two, then three, then one, then four, then five. So you know what order you'll be going in next week. Again, we'll put that in email and with some other information. Uh, reach out to us like you did last week to get a, a schedule for a one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, to meet with us and do your last hour before next week. I suggest you take the feedback and digest it. And we try to schedule those early next week and not tomorrow, uh, please. I think it, you just need a little bit more time between now and then to really bake your, your decks more in your, your narrative. Any questions before we conclude tonight? Isaac, man, you're a friend of us all. We really appreciate your time. It was invaluable, very insightful. I know these teams found it to be um, just very relevant to what they're working on right now as far as, you know, you being through this process before and being a mentor to this process. Uh, it's been great. So really appreciate your time and your feedback. Thank you all for letting me in to the backstage of the, the pitch practice. I, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, I dig that shirt too. I'm going to get one of those. <laughs> we got a, an embroidery company that does, does it 10, 10 bucks a, a shirt. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, uh, but, you know, we, we can work around that. Yeah, I, I bet. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I'm going to conclude the meeting. I did record the whole session. I'm going to upload this to the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, everybody can go and look at their sections. Obviously, the recordings from the other ones we talked about for the one-on-one -on -one sessions, those are up in your team folders as well. Uh, so you have a lot of feedback to review. If that's it, no more questions or any other comments. Thank you all very much for your time, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Yes.